everybody and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Sorry we're a few minutes over. Um, my name is Lisa Rogers and I am Partnership Manager for some of the County Council's Public Health. So with us tonight we've got Matthew Hibbert, a consultant from Somerset County Council's Public Health, Jane Knowles from Somerset Activity Sports Partnership, Catherine Nolan and Helen Fielden from Spark Somerset. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. As a trusted voice in your community and sector, we really appreciate that your attendance and hope that you'll find the session interesting and useful. So we're in the really early process of recruiting for these important COVID champions and we'd really value your support in helping us to recruit. The role of COVID champions is so key to helping us to control the spread of COVID-19. It will be the mechanism by which to develop both preventative and reactive conversations with a number of settings and groups where an outbreak of the virus is likely to have adverse health consequences. Just for an example, homeless people, hostels, businesses that have high proportion of workers who are not engaged with local health services, or where social distancing is challenging and where there may be a number of vulnerable individuals. So thanks again so much for joining us. I'm going to pass you over to Matthew, who will explain a little bit more about the programme and um, the current situation in Somerset as well. Thanks very much, Lisa. Yeah, uh, Matthew Hibbert, consultant in public health. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you a little bit of information about COVID-19 in Somerset. Um, I'll give you some background information about coronavirus, not too much, because I know obviously you've got an interest or you wouldn't be here, so you probably know some of that already. Um, but as well as giving you some information about um, coronavirus in Somerset, I'll also give you some info about our response and talk a little bit about where our COVID champions model fits with that response. I've got some slides and I'm sorry that they're, they're not incredibly um, pretty. I did try to make them as nice as possible, but art is not my strong point, but hopefully they convey convey the things that I want to say. So COVID-19, as you know, infectious disease, it's caused by the novel coronavirus. I think one really important thing to say is that we're still learning about that. We're still learning about what it means. For example, the um, symptom that affects a sense of taste and smell was relatively recent, wasn't it? So there are things that are coming up all the time that give us a better picture of, um, of, the, of the virus, of the illness and its symptoms. Um, yes, so one of the things that's really important is that we've learned that it's a disease that focus, focuses around clusters and outbreaks. And that kind of clustering really means that a local response and a local emphasis on responding is vital to us. So, you know, transmission is taking place in particular settings. We get two or more cases linked by a place in time. And so that we, we call that an outbreak. That's the definition of an outbreak. Um, outbreaks, they seem to cluster. So they seem to kind of stay and spread in particular areas. And one thing that we do know is that when that occurs, it's really hard to get rid of it. So once the virus comes into a community on a particular place, it's really, really hard to get rid of it. And we know that, look, you know, look at some of the situations in, in the north of England where, you know, the virus has got into cities and it's been very, very hard to get it out again. So um, and Liverpool's a good example of that, but but there are others as well. And so that's partly why local action is so important. A local response is is the key is the key to this. I've tried to put in here um, some of the things that we can do and some of the key messages about prevention because you know without a vaccine and without um, very clear and obvious treatments for COVID nineteen our infection control me me measures and our prevention strategies are really the tools in our toolbox. A little visuals, some of them haven't come out actually, we've got little, little visuals here, you know, staying at home, working from home, limiting contact, people will know about the rule of six, keeping distance from people if you go out, washing your hands, self-isolating if you've got symptoms and, and getting a test. These are the things that we can do to try and prevent coronavirus from, from taking an even greater hold in our community. And those are the things that I guess we need you to work with us on. 
Um, we have in Somerset a local outbreak management plan and um, it, if possible I'll, I'll try and I don't know if I know how to do this technically but I'll try and post a link in the chat but if people are interested after this go onto the Somerset County Council website onto the coronavirus pages and you'll find our local outbreak management plan there it breaks down the roles and responsibilities of our um, COVID response, talks about what we in the public health team do, what our colleagues in public health England do and so on. Worth having a look. But really emphasised in that is that prevention is the strategy that we've got to follow. We have to follow the, the prevention, the prevention work and really the incredible importance of individuals, of families, of visitors, of communities in stopping the spread of the virus. Um, if you do follow that link when I post it, what you'll also find is our dashboard, which is updated weekly. And um, um, mm -hmm. again, apologies, not not incredibly uh, attractive slide, but I've tried to pull out some of the things from that just to give you a sense of coronavirus and COVID-19 as it is right now. So situation in Somerset. OK, you can see top left detective cases there. So we've got just over 2000 detected cases in, in Somerset. That's ever. That's since the beginning of the pandemic. The important one is underneath that. If you look, you can see 36.5. Now, people may know in, in, in the press, if I was a bit more technologically um, whiz, I'd do a quiz now and ask you it, how you think that compares to the highest rates in the country. But I'm not, so I'll just tell you. So we're at 36.5 cases per 100,000 of population. OK, so it's a standardised rate and that compares to Liverpool today at 655.8. So 655 compared to 36. So we are miles behind those really, really high areas. But saying that, look at this chart in the bottom left. What you can see is that our seven day rate per 100,000 population is climbing. And if you look over the course of September, the final weeks of September there, you can see that things were pretty much doubling every week. So things in Somerset are still low. They are still manageable. However, they are increasing. So we've got a window of opportunity now, I feel, for us to do something really constructive and to make sure that we can kind of stay on top of things. Actually, if you look at the last couple of weeks in that bar graph, you can see that things are starting to stabilise possibly. Now that, you know, we can never take that at face value, but it does feel like a lot of the action that we're taking that, you know, has been getting a grip on things. And actually, if you look at the triangle circle square, the play school windows at the top you know that and the map which i'm sure you can't see very well were really just to give you an indication of the work that we're doing and to give you a bit of reassurance about that so every day seven days a week myself and my colleagues will look at every single positive case of coronavirus in the in the county we will go through every single situation to work out how any of those cases can be linked and at the moment we're managing 16 such such situations and to give you a flavour those tend to be situations in care homes, in schools, in workplaces and in some other community settings as well and you know we map these out across the county as you can see in the top right so you can see that we've got a really good handle on what's going on so we are you know we're we're seeing what's happening we're working with it on the day by day basis and actually in the bottom right here you can see that that black line is the line showing the numbers of cases confirmed for England and that's from the beginning of October to now so you can see that steep climbs and slight leveling out the green dotted line is the southwest again steepish climb and then leveling out and then look at Somerset the red line we are relatively stable we are relatively flat and I, if I'm honest that's down to the fact that we've got such a fantastic population here we've got a population of people that really care about them, their, their neighbours, really care about their communities and are actually doing the things that they know they need to do to protect each other. I have to say as well, we've got a brilliant public health team, but then I would say that. So a, a, li a little bit more data um, here, and I appreciate these are very, very busy charts uh, and, and I'm not going to kind of give you give you all of the info on here, but you know, 
it, I'm sorry to bring this in, but we do have to remember how serious the situation is with um, coronavirus. We've had 207 deaths due to coronavirus in Somerset. Um, and you can see that those have been split between the deaths that we've had in hospitals largely, then in care homes and in, in some other settings. Um, the first figure is, is the number, the second figure is the percentage. If you have a look at the top right graph, you don't really need to interpret it that, and it might be a bit blurry on your screen, but it, what that is showing is that we have an expected rate of the number of deaths. The rate of the, of the deaths that we have at the moment is not beyond that expected rate, okay? So whilst the numbers are going up, again, talking about that window of opportunity for us to do something proactive, we are in it because the increase in cases that we are seeing is not leading yet to serious hospitalisation and death <clears throat> on a big scale. And if you look further to the left of that graph, top right, and if you look over to the left hand side of the bottom left chart, what you can see is we really had that peak of death back in April, May. And that's when, you know, we were talking about the first wave. It was the real sort of epicentre, wasn't it? You'll remember back then when we were under lockdown. We have not gone back to that point in Somerset yet. yet and we can, we can keep it that way. Um, and then similarly, a, a graph in the bottom right that just shows things around care homes. So I suppose I want to emphasise to you that we still have time to do something about this that we can and we are preventing serious illness and death in our community but we need to do more um, we can't be complacent and we can't do it without the solid and constructive input from people in our community so um, i'm going to whiz through this a little bit but we have got brilliant national examples of where schemes like this covid19 champions have been really effective in helping to um, respond to outbreaks and manage outbreaks when they've occurred and also crucially be involved in that prevention work to be the eyes and ears of the public health team to communicate really effectively about what's going on in in communities and to prevent um, situations from escalating when they're identified and some examples here tower hamlet's a great one i've looked at the scheme that's in southampton there was one in newham all slightly different models but all brilliant um, opportunities brilliant ways to get into communities so this role is really about looking at how we can work with you work with the people that you know the people that you might be in touch with to say that you have individuals that are identified that want to be more active. We want to provide information, advice, support, guidance to be able to put that out to people that can take it into the heart of the community. But we also want to find a way for that information to come back to us so that we get a better insight into what's going on, what are the issues on the ground and how we can do things differently. And the two layers on this slide are kind of outlined we are really interested in everyone. The wider community champions are incredibly important and people that are motivated and enthusiastic. We desperately want those people to work with us, you know, um, and we can commit to providing that support and information to those people. We also really want people that are in targeted settings. So we know that there are particular community groups and particular settings in the community that are at a higher risk of transmission and um, outbreaks and clusters of the virus. So part of this event this evening was just to just to say to you, we really, really want your buy and we really, really want your support and we really want your access to the people that you know that might be able to fulfill this role with us for the benefit of all of our communities. I'll stop talking there because I can talk for a really long time and actually my timer went off a couple of minutes ago, so I did try and limit myself. So I'm going to hand over now to um, colleagues from our delivery partners from Spark and from SAS so they can tell you a little bit more about um, their role with things. Thank you, Matthew. Um, hi, everybody. Um, 
I'm Catherine Nolan. I'm from Spark, Somerset, um, and I'll be handing you over in a little moment, actually, to my colleague Helen, um, who's going to be coordinating this, um, uh, the, the the network of, of COVID community champions, and so she'll be able to talk a lot more about it. But I'll just give a little a brief overview as well. Um, Matthew did a great job there uh, in terms of kind of saying what we're trying to do um, with these COVID community champions. So I just wanted to give a bit of background really about why Spark are involved um, and, and how we'd like to work with you. So Spark, for those of you who don't know, we are um, a voluntary sector infrastructure organisation. We provide support and training for the sector. Um, we provide the volunteer service too, um, including the recent Corona Helpers website that we launched. Um, and we've also got a role around kind of representing the sector um, and kind of adv advocating on, on your behalf. Um, and during COVID, the, the community response has been absolutely amazing. And I have to say, it's been a real pleasure to work alongside groups and volunteers um, to support our communities. Um, obviously, it's, be, it's been a tough time, but I think it has been a real pleasure. As I say, I think we've seen such amazing community spirit. Um, and I think it's been really great also to see that the voluntary community action that we've seen is finally getting the recognition that it deserves. Um, so we're pleased to be part of this, to, to be part of this, um, this this new initiative, because I think meaningful engagement with our with our community is what's going to get us through this. Um, and at Spark, the work that we do with the knowledge that we've got, the experience and the existing networks that we've got, um, we think we're, we're very keen to do anything we can to support people in Somerset to make sense of the current challenges um, and feel confident about keeping themselves safe and healthy. Um, and it's, so it's really great as well to welcome community groups here this evening, because I think while we want to create this network, we, we want to do this with you. Your insights and your experience are going to be incredibly valuable. Um, and as, as, as Matthew mentioned, I think particularly in terms of reaching those communities, um, th those, th those particular target groups that, that we'd, we'd like to engage with, with the most. Um, I was going to pass on to Jane from SASP now. Um, unfortunately, she's having some difficulty getting on. So um, I don't want to kind of speak on her behalf, but I know that she's very keen to be part of this too. SASP, Somerset Activity and Sports Partnership, obviously are massively embedded in the local community, working with many of these groups that, that Matthew referred to um, and have a real passion and commitment to supporting um, community health and wellbeing in Somerset. So it's great to work. Um, before I pass over to Helen, one, one quick point as well. I'm sure you've already seen, but there's a box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and if you've got any questions, we'll be taking questions just in a few minutes time. So please feel free to, 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 to do that uh, and put your questions in there. I'm going to hand over to Helen now. So Helen is our, um, Helen Fielding, she's um, a community, uh, sorry, the voluntary, I'll get there in a minute, volunteer development officer. Um, <laughs> I'll get there in the end, Helen, um, and uh, at Spark, and she'll be um, coordinating the development of the COVID um, community champion network um, over the coming months. Th thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Matthew, can you scroll through the slides to the role of the community COVID community champion slide, please? Oh, we're there. Great. Thank you. Right. So it's a little bit more detail now about um, the role of the um, COVID community champion, which is why we're all here tonight. Um, I'm really excited about being involved in this project. It, it's I think it's a really exciting opportunity to reach out to some of the communities in Somerset. Um, so one of the so the, the key part um, of the COVID community champion is passing on messages to their friends, family and communities um, about COVID and about how to keep themselves safe and healthy. So an important part of what they're doing is that they need to keep in touch with me to make sure they're getting up to date information. They'll be expected to um, attend a brief COVID champion training. We want to keep this as light touch as possible. We're not asking for a big commitment um, from community champions because we appreciate that people have lots going on. Um, so there'll be a couple of hours training and then regular meetings that they can join in. Um, I think probably similar format tonight to tonight, but well, less formal, but a Zoom meeting every couple of weeks just for people to check in, make sure they're getting up to date information. But what we also want is feedback about how things are going on the ground, not asking people to dog. We're not going to be giving high vis jackets and asking people to be um, uh, marshals what we just want is information about how things are going any problems with communication that kind of stuff so that we can feed things back um 
and then um, also just letting us make sure that we can improve things and keep on getting things better. And the key role that SAS will be um, having in this as well is about helping me to feed in messages about staying fit and healthy. Um, you know, if we go into lockdown, how people are going to stay fit and healthy, how that affects your mental health. Um, and um, and also about staying fit and healthy to reduce the impact of COVID on your health long term as well. Um, if, if you do get infected, then if, if you're fit and healthy, then you're likely to be less seriously affected. Um, and then in terms of some of the skills, I mean, we just we want as many people as possible to be involved. Um, but it's important that they have an interest in helping people to stay healthy, that they're good communicators, um, that they're willing to learn more. Obviously, we want to make sure that they're learning the messages that are coming through from government and from public health to be reliable and dependable um, and also to have a sensitive and caring attitude towards others. It's about helping people to make the right choices for themselves um, rather than, um, you know, sure. preaching about how they should behave. Um, and so the benefit for them is that um, they get um, the COVID champion training. Um, also access to other Spark training courses. We've got a full, um, co very comprehensive training programme, which um, community champions would also have access to if they'd like it. And um, I think it'll look very good on CVs if people want to get involved in health, um, working in health in the future. Um, and also, <coughs> excuse me, um, a good opportunity to learn more about COVID-19 and make sure as an individual um, you're up to date on what's going on. Um, so how do I plan to do it? It's really early days. I literally started working work on the project on Monday and I'm really excited. Um, my first step planned is to um, to find out where the greatest need is. Public health have already identified um, priority groups, but I think it's about going reaching out to those groups and finding out how things are there and also possibly identifying things that we haven't picked up on so far. I mean, obviously, rural isolation is a big issue. Um, so and young people, again, there's another group we might want to work with. Um, once we've identified which communities should be priorities, then it's identifying the key players. Who are the linchpins and people likely to be listened to within the communities, then providing training. And then it's a process of providing ongoing support and keeping in touch with those um, COVID community champions. Um, at the moment, the project is set to run for a year, so it's an ongoing thing. Um, I would like to think you know, it'd be amazing if we didn't have to keep going for a year, but that's the plan long term. Um, and that's yeah, so that's how I plan to do it. Um, I think. Moving on to the next slide. Um, what do we see as the key issues and communities that you work in and what do you think of the potential stumbling blocks? I think it'd be really good to hear from you about those things in the Q&A. Um, I think I'm done now, um, so I'll hand back uh to um oh yeah can we have the next slide please matthew excellent yes so those are questions for you um if you have any comments then maybe you could put those in the q a and we can discuss shortly but i'll hand back to lisa now thanks helen thanks catherine and matthew that was a really brilliant presentation of what we're looking to achieve um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat um so thank you very much for those I think one of these is probably best placed for Matthew to answer. So we have a question, all COVID deaths, is that because of COVID or because of another cause? Yeah, that's a really topical question, isn't it? Because do you remember there was the issue about how at one point deaths due to COVID were being measured as having experienced COVID at any point? And that would then mean that the death certificate was marked with COVID. I think what we do now is measure deaths from COVID as de as um, somebody had tested positive within the for COVID in a period before their death. And I, re I, I recall that that was 28 days. So that should be a measure that is up to date and is recording people that tested positive for COVID within that period of time before they died, because I, I think that was adjusted. But it's a, it's a good spot and it's a, it's a good point um, because, yeah, that was an issue early on, wasn't it? Thanks, Matthew. That's really helpful. 
We've had another question here. Um, so this is a really good question. It's probably being covered, but just checking. Will you have text and social media ready for us to use in trying to recruit volunteers? Absolutely. Thank you so much. That just shows that um, you know we're really engaging you in, in wanting to help us with our recruitment drive. So yes, absolutely. We'll be sharing that um, in the time to come. And if, if you would like to register an interest with, with Helen, um, we can pop the link in the chat. Um, which is the link to sort of register the interest and then all the information sort of going forward can be shared through there. So thank you for that. Uh, we look like we have another one as well, just asking in terms of other support that's available on top of telephone support, shopping prescription support and contributing to food banks. Um, what has been shown is that there were already informal support structures in place and good neighbours are just filling the gap. Matthew? I would bring Catherine into that because she's been um, she's been very involved in in the sort of volunteer response throughout. Catherine, are you comfortable with answering that? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, David, that there's there's um, amazing stuff going on in communities. And I think as well as the, the kind of formal voluntary sector, there's lots and lots of local um, community based activity that, that, that's happening on quite an informal basis. Um, and I think what we found is um, much of that does tend to be run by volunteers. And I think what we're really seeing at the moment is that many of those local informal groups tend to be being um, kind of uh, supported by what we call the civic core, which tend to be the older generation who are volunteering to support the community. And many of those have actually been impacted by COVID. So I think what we're seeing is that some of those groups are actually struggling at the moment to continue. So what I would really like to kind of advocate, and I think that's what we're trying to do as an organisation, is those COVID-19 groups, those that kind of um, that real kind of pouring of community cohesion and community support and community spirit that's been going on think about how else you could support your communities and actually um, we've got a member of staff who that's what she's exactly what she's going to be doing over the coming months because I think going forward I think we are going to see I think it's fair to say you know there are going to be issues around mental health there are going to be issues around housing around debt um, you know there, 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 there are going to be pressures on our community that result from COVID um, and so I would really encourage people in with, within communities, if you are wanting to do more, look out and see what other groups exist, see which other organisations are there and whether they need help. Um, you know, it's not just the immediate emergency response. You know, I, I would really encourage that you support those amazing community and voluntary organisations that are actually providing really important services within communities as well. I hope that answers your question, David. Thanks, that was a really comprehensive response. Um, we have one other question here around, um, this is probably one for Helen, uh, will we have to wear protective clothing if we volunteer in this role? No, you won't. Um, the, the expectation is that you're not doing, you're just going around your normal business and talking to people that you would see in your day to day life. Um, we wouldn't expect you to be going into places where people you know people to be infected or anything like that the idea is it's very light touch it's just as you're going about your business you share the covid messages you don't have to go into anywhere that you don't feel comfortable or safe um so hopefully that was the question it also says can you volunteer to do evenings only you mm -hmm. can do it whenever you like that's again it's light touch it's whenever you feel that you want to do it Thanks, Helen. Okay. We've had a few more coming in. So have we got some promotional material on social media and hard copies to email? Absolutely, that will be coming. This is really early, early days in the process and we wanted to engage you as sort of trusted community leaders um, in the first instance and we'll definitely be sharing that with you. And I would really appreciate if you could sign up to the link that we'll post in the chat um, to register an interest so that Helen can then share things with you going forward. I think I answered that one. Uh, how do you see winter impacting? And that's a really good question, probably one for, for Matthew. Yes, winter is going to be really significant, isn't it? So we know that um, the pressures on our 
hospitals and on all our medical services are much higher during the winter. This winter will be no exception and we're obviously going to be dealing with coronavirus as well. What I'll say is on behalf of health service partners that the system in Somerset is standing by, it's standing ready, it's able to cope with the forecast amount and a huge amount of work has been has gone into kind of planning for that. There are additional facilities that have been made available that were stood up at the peak of coronavirus back in April, May. Those are still there and a huge amount of extra resources were created back then. We've got a lot more PP, we've got a lot more of the um, sort of high end medical equ equipment that might be needed. It's going to be tough, but I think that we're in the best prepared place that we can be. Thanks, Matthew. I've got a few more questions coming in, which is really brilliant. Hello? seem to have lost a bit of connection. Can you? Maybe you, Lisa. Okay, okay, great. Sorry, I thought I'd lost connection. So other questions, We've got lots coming in, which is great. So, um, oh wow, there's lots here, okay. Would the village agents be people who could identify some champions? I would say absolutely. What do you think, Helen and, and Catherine? And Matthew even, it's probably one for all of us. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that is that is absolutely what this meeting is about as well. I think it's about obviously doing you can do a general call out to the community, but it would be about using the existing networks. So the village agents, you know, other organisations that are working across Somerset, OGK, um, other social prescribing organisations. Oh, Helen, I think you're off. I'm echoing. That's it. Am I? Should I mute myself? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, uh, that's absolutely what this is all about. It's kind of linking in with the existing networks, um, voluntary sector organisations, informal networks, um, and and absolutely kind of it's very much much going to be a team effort. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And I think that relates to I saw a couple of questions below that as well. Women's Institute, you've mentioned street pastors, absolutely all of those. Um, we'll be reaching out and and, um, and and trying to link in with with those organisations. Um, as I say, no one organisation has has kind of um, knows everything about what's going on in Somerset. So this is very much going to be a team effort. Sorry, Helen, did you want to come in as well? Uh, sorry, no, I, I was just braced in case you needed help, but it's all good. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's another comment um, question here from Julie. Um, which is, is harsh reality, really. People living with dementia are a high priority. There are other deaths that relate to COVID. Uh, people due to family isolation, people living with dementia have given up to stop cheating, passed away alone, which is terrible. And, and go on to say here that you've supported three families with this situation. So. It, it is a really harsh reality. Um, I don't know whether Matthew has any. The only thing that I can say is that, I mean, um, I'm not saying that COVID champions or that any of the kind of work that we're doing around engaging with the community is going to make any, you know, could have prevented those situations or could have, you know, will be able to make sure that things are different in the future. I guess what this gives us is an opportunity for closer communication, faster communication. And if there is a way that we can improve the way that health services are kind of orientating themselves around the community and are able to respond to the things that you're experiencing, then this is a way to do it because we really want to give you and other people in the community a voice to be able to feed back to us about ways that things could be um, improved both around preventing outbreaks, controlling outbreaks, but also experience, you know, the experience that you're having about, you know, people that are ill with coronavirus. So I'm sorry to hear about your experiences. I'm not saying that we could prevent them in the future, but at least this gives us a, ch a chance to try to make things better for people that are suffering. Um, it gives us one way of doing that. 
Thank, yeah, thank you, Matthew. And actually, Julia, I'm really interested in, in speaking a little bit more to you around some of the other work that I'm doing as partnership manager and the advisory network and just sort of pulling groups and organisations together to help sort of health and wellbeing as, um, amongst the community as a whole. So um, I'm going to pop my email address in your um, in the response there and I'd really appreciate if you give me an email and we can, we can take that offline. So I'd really like to talk to you more about that. So what else do we have? We have... Um, would you like experienced teams like street pastors? Oh yeah, we've done that. Catherine touched on that. And absolutely, that sounds absolutely what we've been looking for. Village agents, village email group. Sounds brilliant. Someone said here that they have a village email group. Um, again, that sounds fantastic. If you could um, register, which I'm not sure if we've popped it in, but we will do um, the link for you to register your interest. Um, we can get back to you on that. That'd be fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, we've got some other ones around social media and Facebook groups. Absolutely, thank you. That, that's that's going to be key. We've got such a big reach amongst our organisations. We've got another question here. Will champions gain some mental health training to help towards signposting? Well, I would say definitely. Uh, I mean, we're working really closely with some of our key colleagues in, um, in mental health, in public health. Um, so that's definitely something that we that we want to be built into the training. But again, I can pass that on to Helen and Catherine to sort of touch on a bit more. I think that's definitely, um, I'll back you up on that. Yeah, it's um, an important element, um, a bit of mental health first aid training. Um, light would, I think would be really good um, in terms of keeping themselves healthy and helping other people to stay healthy as well. It's a really good point, Colleen, thank you. There's a question here around all people living with dementia being added to the government vulnerable list so they can in particular access supermarket slots. Yeah, and said so should this needs arise again? I mean, I'm sure that's something we can, Matty, maybe, I don't know, it's, it's a national decision, isn't it? But what, what, what would your thoughts be on that? Well, we, what we've tried to do in Somerset, as well as having that shielded list, if you remember, there was that shielded list of highly clinically vulnerable people. Now, that was nationally determined and we effectively received that. We also did some work in Somerset about identifying who we thought locally needed additional support. It might be that we didn't pick up on people with dementia, so we maybe didn't capture that when we were doing that work back in April. Um, if we're going back into a situation where we have more uh, restrictions in place, then, um, you know, there's definitely an opportunity to revise that. That's something that we're we're in control of. So, again, I mean, Lisa's um, so that she would put her email in, my, in the chat. If I can work out how to do it in a minute, I'll put mine in and it would be good to hear a little bit more about that so that we can make sure it's um, something that we pick up. Thanks, Matthew. Um, we've got some other really, really useful comments here and just can't thank you all enough. Um, Health Watch Somerset do a lot of signposting and would like to be kept up to date with the organisations and groups supporting others for this cause. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. We'll, we'll keep a note of that. And again, if you'd like to sign up um, to register an interest, we can keep you posted of everything going forward. Um, there's going to be a launch for national campaign lottery money to encourage volunteers in November. Yes, yeah, so that's something slightly different uh, from what I believe. I don't know whether Matthew's got a bit more in involvement in that, a bit more information. No, hopefully Catherine will. Oh, OK. <laughs> Um, I literally heard about that today, actually. Um, so I don't have a huge amount of de uh, detail about it. But I did have a conversation with um, with a colleague from the lottery today. So, yes, yeah, certainly find out more. I don't think it's necessarily going to um, uh, kind of cross over with this. But certainly I think there's just generally a real interested interest in, cur in encouraging voluntary volunteering and social action um as ju it's just a really good thing for people to do so yeah um thank you louise i'll um I'll, I'll certainly have a look into it and see if we can link in with it closely thank you yeah thanks catherine um someone's asked the recommended covid cleaning advice in the area um so i that i mean it depends on the setting i guess um matthew if, if following the national guidance really i mean we're happy to post that within within the chat if that's helpful 
Yeah, I mean, that's right. Cleaning, it can be quite a, a complex area. It depends on what sorts of surfaces you're cleaning and in which environments. So would probably need to give you some specific information about that. Obviously, we know we want people to wash their hands as frequently as, as possible um, <clears throat> for at least 20 seconds. But um, there is, you know, basically bleach based cleaners are the cleaners that we would expect are most effective. I have some very lengthy technical documents about specifications of cleaning <laughs> chemicals, which I'm happy to look into. So if you've got a specific question about that, again, drop me a line and I'll make sure that I answer it. Great, thanks, Matthew. Um, this is an interesting question, which I'm sure Catherine and Helen will have a response to. Is the advice still that over 70s should avoid volunteering? I can answer that one. If Catherine would like me to. Uh, it's no, is the short answer. It's a case by case scenario. Um, and the organisation that you're looking to volunteer for would do a risk assessment and decide whether it's safe for you to do so. Um, but no, it's not the case that it's not safe for over 70s to volunteer. Can I just also add, add in also that volunteering is a, a huge area and there are loads of different things you can do and it actually kind of remote volunteering is something that's becoming increasingly popular, um, especially during COVID and I think even in terms of the COVID champions that we're talking about here, you know, this doesn't have to, you could still do this and, and, and not put yourself at risk, you know, you could have a phone call with somebody. Um, it doesn't necessarily involve you going out and about uh, and putting yourself at risk if you are anxious as well. So I think it's worth adding that as well. Uh, definitely. <laughs> it's very much the point. You just you just do this role as you're going about your business. You're not going to go anywhere that you wouldn't normally go. It, it's yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Ray. Um, Adrian said here, Public Health England advertised free online psychological training course. That's really great to know during COVID and free mental health first aid training as well. So thank you for that information. And then we've got some other information here, which is just really useful um, as well. So there's no more questions yet, but if, if there's any more, please pop them in the chat. We'll, we'll still be here for a moment or so to answer. Oh, someone said here the talking cafes are a great idea they're looking for people subjects to include brilliant yeah we, we will link in with the talking cafes uh, they've been really helpful to promote some of our key messages kind of to date so yeah thank you for that uh, are we looking for a covid champion in each somerset parish helen catherine um more yes <laughs> <laughs> as wide as spread as possible. I mean, obviously, we will be targeting certain places in terms of high risk or vulnerable um, communities. But yes, it'd be amazing if we could have a COVID champion in each Somerset parish. Yeah, I think just to reiterate what Helen said, it, it's this is very organic. It's not it's not your usual kind of volunteering thing where you, you have a kind of a, a role within a certain area. You need to fill those vacancies. It is very much kind of the more the merrier, anyone who wants to get involved, anyone who wants to dial in and listen to the, you know, get the latest guidance um, and understand, uh, you know, um, take part, then they're very, very welcome to. I think obviously if we've got certain areas where we don't have, have anyone, then we'll, then we'll want to fill those gaps. Um, but yeah, absolutely. It would be great if we could have, have someone, at least one in every parish, that'd be wonderful. Someone's asked how we'll capture the effectiveness and uh, evidence that the scheme. Would you like me to answer? Yeah. 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 I yeah, I think it's a really interesting question, Colleen, and I think there's that balance between kind of recording things for, for, for the sake of it. I think with this, because we want it to be really community based, we want it's, it's based on nudge theory, really. It's about spreading messages through communities and, 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 and hoping that that has a really positive impact on behaviour. We're not going to be measuring this. We're not going to be talking to COVID champions and saying how 
many people have you spoken to today? You know, there really is no expectation. What we're just hoping is that we get people involved in this who are passionate about supporting their community and supporting the health and well-being of their neighbours and their friends, um, and that it just becomes a bit of a movement, really. So I think the way we will see it, it will be difficult to demonstrate cause and effect, but it will simply be that hopefully, hopefully we will we will keep our community health and you know safe and healthy, and that we won't see significant uh, outbreaks like we've seen in other parts of the country. I don't know whether there's anything else that you would like to add, Matthew. Does that? Yeah, I think I think you're quite right. Catherine, the, the sort of behaviour change nurture programmes that they are difficult to to measure. However, we'll see the impact of it. And I think just tonight, seeing the attendance that we've got here, and I feel like it's the sort of thing based on previous volunteer schemes that Catherine's su successfully done. Um, I feel like this is going to be really successful. And we've actually got someone here, Julie, asking, um, could we volunteer, use some of the volunteer groups that appeared during the lockdown? And I think that's one for you, Catherine, because that's exactly what we've discussed. Do you want me to answer, Catherine? Oh, she's she's got lost, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, yes. cool. Yes, cool, excellent. Um, yes, we definitely want to tap in. We, we've got um, pretty good links with many of the um, community groups have popped up in response to COVID and we really want to work with them and tap into those because they're the people really working on the ground um, and also give them a bit of support because people may be feeling a bit jaded by now. So um, yeah, give them something new and interesting and give them a bit of support, which we're doing ongoing. We've got a bespoke worker who's working just with those groups as well. So yeah. Okay, some um, We've got a question here. What support will there be if you do talk to someone you are concerned about? So how, how this question, I guess, is around escalation. Probably one for you, Helen. OK, great. Um, yes, I think that's just about keeping up communication and then knowing that I'm here. If they have concerns, there'll be safe, some safeguarding included in the training. Um, and also, it's not always a nice nine to five system as well. So it's them knowing what they can do if they have a concern out of hours, um, which we've, you know, we've, we've collated that information with to, that we've to use with the COVID groups that we've already worked with before. So we're making that available to people as well. So they know what to do if they have concerns. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Helen. Um, are the local PCSOs involved? They can be. Nobody's involved yet. So um, yes, exactly. it's great. <laughs> I think that's something we've got a lot of links in with um, Somerset County Council Public Health with with other organisations such as PCSOs and other local authorities and things like that. So yeah, it's definitely be something we would like to look to link in with with other organisations and groups. So yeah, thank you for that. And Colleen has said something here, which is about the targets and. Uh, how we're looking to change behaviours and create positivity, which is it's exactly right, which is what we all need, I think. OK, we don't have any more questions coming in. Oh, we do. OK, diverse communities are linked in with the village agent. Yeah, OK, thank you. Oh, can, can dementia friends training be included? Well, that's interesting. Oh, that's a very good question, Julie. Um... I think if people, oh, that's a tricky one because I don't want to overload people with training, but I think it's really relevant. So I think we'll have to work a way of weaving that in. Yes, it's very important. That's really useful, actually, because it's, yeah, it can help. The information that we get from you can kind of help to inform the, the training package. So, yeah, that's definitely something we can think about. Thanks, yeah. Julie. Um, we're not seeing any more questions coming in and um, we've got a few more minutes left so please pop them in if you'd like us to answer anything else but we're still here oh we've got no, nothing. thank you we've had lots of great response so yeah any any other questions just feel free to pop them in we've got another few more minutes
I may have missed one. Thank you, Lucy, for flagging. The faith communities will happily respond oh, no, I, to any requests from those wanting to talk about issues relating to bereavement or faith related to stitch. That's brilliant. Taunton Team Chaplaincy is one route to access help. Bath and Wells first and multi faith police chaplains can obtain help from Christian faith leaders. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I've popped a little comment in there actually asking for an email address. So, but again, if you're to register, and Helen's popped her um, the link in the chat now. Um, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Everyone's been very helpful. Yeah, I, apparently I typed my email wrong. I'm just doing oh, it right oh, now. Oh, sorry. OK, here we are. I'm Thank doing you. it right now. So. <laughs> OK, oh, well, no, thanks, David, for pointing that out. That's great. Yeah. It's been a long day. Sorry, David. Oh. Yeah, it's been a long week, yeah. Try that. Let's see if that one works. Right, I'll send that now. OK, so if there's no more questions, we'll give a few more minutes. Thank you, everyone, ever so much for attending. We really appreciate your interest and all the active questions and comments we've had. Just absolutely brilliant. I think I probably speak for everyone when I say that. It's just very exciting that we're about to launch this and we've had so much support so quickly. So, yeah, brilliant. Thanks ever so much. Uh, does anyone else want to sort of finish off with anything? No, just looking forward to working with everyone. Great. Oh, we have one more question here. Is there a plan for care home family visits to be improved to support health and wellbeing of carers as well as those in care homes? Matthew? I think it depends on the guidelines, doesn't it, Matthew, really at, at the current time? It does. And, um, you know, it's always a really really difficult situation Julie you know we know that people being able to see their loved ones in care homes is incredibly important for their well-being and for the well-being of the care home residents it's not something that anybody would ever take lightly to restrict that I think that we have to make a decision as things stand and you will be aware we, we put that information out um, live on the safeguarding adults website it's always posted down I'm sure in other places as well about the current the current situation We've tried in the past to make sure that whatever action we've taken has been proportionate and really is just about managing um, pressing risks. But obviously when the pressing risks do occur, we have to put you know, risks to life first. And um, so sometimes ha do have to make those difficult um, decisions. So what I would say is we are always approaching those situations to try to give families access to care homes we are always trying to do that and we would we only talk to our colleagues in adult social care about bringing those restrictions in when we really have no choice um so you know it might not be a direct action a direct answer to your question but i just wanted you to understand you know the framework in which those decisions are made it's always difficult thanks matthew so we've got about three more minutes so um if probably got time for one more question before we bring it to a close but Helen's popped her email in the chat, so any further information that you might like or just to register an interest, please, please contact Helen and be informed of the, the plans that we've got coming up over the next few weeks. We will be, yeah, we'll be mailing stuff out anyway. There'll be stuff on its way in the next few weeks. So, yeah, excellent. OK, hey. well, I'd like to finish by saying thank you so much for all of you that have taken the time out of your busy day to come and attend tonight and hear about our COVID champions plans um, and for your support. And um, we look forward to seeing and working with you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.